Hello, everyone. Good morning. Apologies for the late start. I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you so much and welcome to Understanding Information Security and the Data Protection Act. My name is Gracia White. Hope you're seeing me a little clearly. Right, I want to welcome, of course, our presenting partners who are Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus, Hart Muirhead Fata, Calibra Solutions Limited, and Data Privacy and Security Advisors. Before we start, I will just do a run through of today's proceedings, just so you get an idea of what's gonna happen here. So the objective of today's webinar is to provide an understanding of the complex landscape of information security and the key standards and terms, the specifications of what the Jamaica Data Protection Act 2020 entails, the implications for organizations and the compliant ready actions that should be taken. We will first start with the team from Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus, followed by presentations from our three speakers, George White, Justin Collins, and James Coons. And after the final presentation, we will open the floor for questions and then close us out. Please feel free to, to ask any questions in our Q&A box so we can include them in the session. And without further ado, I will hand over to the Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus. Please allow me to welcome Mrs. Alafia Dali Johnson, Ms. Shani Gray, and Ms. Shireen Farkison. Good morning, ladies. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Ms. White. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed presenters and dear participants, a warm welcome to each one of you to this significant gathering. Data Protection Data Privacy Information Security Webinar, an event of paramount importance in our pursuit of safeguarding information in the digital age. I am honored to offer opening remarks on behalf of the principal of the JCE campus, Mr. Kevin Powell, who is unavoidably absent for today's session. In our ever-connected world where data flows seamlessly and technology shapes every aspect of our lives, the importance of data privacy cannot be overstated. It is not just a matter of personal security, but one of fundamental human rights that deserve our utmost attention and protection. Today, we come together as a community of individuals, educators, professionals, and advocates, all united by a common cause, to enhance our understanding of data privacy and cultivate a culture of responsible data management. As we delve into this webinar, we aim to equip ourselves with the knowledge and tools necessary to navigate the complexities of the digital landscape responsibly. Throughout the course of this session, we will engage in thought-provoking discussions, gain insights from experts in the field, and explore best practices for ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of sensitive information. Our goal is to foster an environment where data privacy is not just a buzzword, but an integral part of our collective consciousness. I encourage each one of you to actively participate ask questions, share experiences, and embrace the spirit of collaboration. Together, we can lay the groundwork for a safer, more secure digital future, one where data protection is at the forefront for all our endeavors. As we embark on this enlightening journey, let us remember that knowledge is power, and with knowledge comes great responsibility. The knowledge we gain here today will not only influence our personal lives, but also ripple through our professional roles and wider communities. I extend my sincere appreciation to our partners, Calibra Solutions Limited, Hart Murad Fata, Data Privacy and Security Advisors, for making this webinar the success that it promises to be. Your dedication to advancing data privacy awareness is truly commendable. Again, on behalf of management and the team of the Jamaica Stock Exchange and the Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus, a warm welcome to everyone, and may this session prove to be a transformative experience for us all. Thank you.
Thank you, Alafia. Shanique or Shireen, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session this morning. I am going to be sharing um, just a little bit of information about our compliance course. I am just trying to make sure that I can share my screen with you. <clears throat> All right, I hope everyone is seeing my screen right now. All right, so our postgraduate in certificate and compliance and information and governance actually takes into consideration our data protection course, which you're about to get some information on now. We have four courses in our compliance and information governance course. I will give you information on two, and Ms. Farkison will go ahead with two others, but I'm just going to <clears throat> give you just an oversight for this. <clears throat> Based on our organization in terms of making sure that persons and organizations overall have the necessary equipments that are readily available to them and just having a basic understanding of the Data Protection um, Act and being able to have their persons have the certification as data protection officers or even just making sure that they understand the what the requirements are as it pertains to the rules and laws of the of the land, so to speak, which you'll get some further information on that. So our postgraduate in compliance and information government actually goes into anti-money laundering, data protection, information governance and security principles, along with our company compliance and administration. <clears throat> I will discuss our data protection and company compliance administration along with <clears throat> um, some more information coming from Ms. Farkasman on the anti-money laundering and the information governance security principles course. Our data protection course is actually headed by um, Ms. Justine Collins, who you'll hear more from as we go throughout this program. <clears throat> So our company and compliance information governance, so company compliance management administration course is very intensive. It actually goes through, as you can see, a list of um, things that you actually need in terms of just some laws as it pertains to what it is that you're required for banking, financing, and just the laws and regulation of company compliance, just ensuring organizations and their employees have what is needed as it pertains as different factors. Um, understanding the elementary principles of effective compliance and factors that make up the compliance process and understanding and gathering programs with the application of a wide range of organizations and private firms, nonprofit organizations, and so on. For our data protection course, which you will get um, further information here as to some of the changes that have come about and the requirements that organizations need to have. <clears throat> Our course will make sure that you're ready for that, that you're certified as needed. I'll give you an understanding of data protection at, as it changes and whatever has been added to it um, as the years and times go by. Um, army with legal requirements according to the GDPR and so on ensure organizations and compliance, proper handling and gathering and use of information. And usually very highly interactive and based on some of the discussions in which Ms. Collins has taken on, just making sure that um, giving you practical um, acts that have gone by and some of the cases that have Protein to just data protection overall. I'll hand over to, oh, and uh, all these courses can be done individually. 
bad persons. So it's not a case where you need to do all to be a part of the program, but you can be doing them data protection separately, anti-money laundering separately, the compliance and information governance separately. And it's not just for persons who are required to do data protection officers, but just for persons in organization who have anything to do with any information as it goes by, just so it is that you can understand basic needs. So anybody in HR, anybody who has to deal with any documentation from different individuals, anything that you have to do with any documentation as it relates to people in general. And just so it is that you have an overall understanding of what is required for the rules and laws of the regulation. That. All right, our individual courses are 65,000, um, along with a registration fee of 25. And if it is that you want to reach out to us separately, you can. And Ms. Parkinson will go into um, the other two courses that we have connected to this program. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. I'm Shireen Farkasan, one of two recruiters at Jamaica Stock Exchange's eCampus. I will be introducing our AML certificate course. And this is a six week certificate course, competitively priced at 65,000 Jamaican dollars plus GCT. The AML certificate course targets persons working in compliance, data protection, or information governance. Our AML certificate course equips you to, among other things, understand money laundering, terrorism financing, and financial sanctions, access and evaluate specific vulnerabilities of your institution to money laundering and terrorism financing, strategize based on your management obligations, and your legal and regulatory regime, structure appropriate daily anti-money laundering activities, and discriminate the major sources of money laundering and terrorism financing, among other things. Our AML certificate is aimed at bolstering realistic ways of meeting the anti-money laundering obligations placed upon your organization. I had shared a flyer of our AML. I expect it will be sent to you so you get, you get an opportunity to see what it is about. But some of the topics that we do cover are key international AML and CFT legislative and regulatory initiatives, fraud deterrence, prevention, detection, customer due diligence, and more. For further information, I may be reached at 876-833-9311, 876-967-3271. I may also be emailed at shererne dot farquharson at jamstock, that is j-a-m-s-t-o-c-k-e-x.com. I will be able to send you information on all our courses offered through the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And our courses are done online, so they can be accessed wherever you are in the region. Um, we have mainly online um, facilities. So you may always just reach out to me, whatever area of interest you may have, whether it's compliance or business or investment related. And I can always email to you, brochures that speak to your area of concern. Do enjoy the rest of our presentation and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Shireen. And we will share your contact information as part of our thank you emails. Thank that, you. Know, just in case people didn't get a chance to, to get the information you shared, right? Thank you. So I'm going to now hand over to Mr. George White, who will be speaking on Calibra Solutions Limited specifically. I'm actually gonna be doing his specific presentation. So I will share my screen and then 
ask Mr. White to start. George, once you see the screen, you can start. Morning, everyone. Happy to be part of this presentation. Thanks for joining from your busy schedules. As a team, we collectively thought there's a big challenge for the Jamaican co business community to be compliant um, with the Data Protection Act, the legislation and all that goes with it. However, what we thought is that it would be very useful for us to combine our skills and knowledge and uh, provide facilities to empower and enable all companies, all individuals to have the awareness and the tools and the ability to be compliant. First of all, by having an understanding of all the underlying um, reasons for getting this done. My purpose this morning is to talk a little bit about Calibra Solutions Limited, our company, and at a very high level, 40,000 feet, talk a little bit about the Data Protection Act, and then our experts, our subject matter experts will go into a lot more of the details. So I'll very quickly go through a little bit about Calibra. We will talk about the company overview, solutions we provide our, our partners, um, information on a few of our customers and um, talk a little bit about the Data Protection Act, how we are, where we are at this point in time. So a little bit about Calibra. Um, I'm a Jamaican who has settled in Trinidad and Tobago for 20 years. Calibra was started 15 years ago. And while we have our head office in Trinidad and Tobago, we have employees and consultants spread across Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and the USA. We serve a regional customer base, including not only the traditional English-speaking territories, but non-English-speaking. And our mission is to apply technology to accelerate change across enterprises and create lasting value. Our value proposition and we, we have two broad areas, information security and business analytics. Information security, our main product areas are providing cyber res resilience, dark web intelligence, trust intelligence, which resonates with you know, why we're here this morning. Uh, we provide a platform of trust intelligence that includes data privacy. Uh, but just to update you, Today's event is not going to be about demonstrating any software. In fact, it's really about other related important attributes. But we do provide a platform that you can utilize um, to, to manage the area in terms of privacy management and related aspects. We're also a business analytics company um, focusing on allowing companies to leverage the power of their data. Your data tells an, a story, and it, it, it's of tremendous value to be able to leverage that data um, using the cloud analytics, getting in-depth business insights, and being able to monitor and um, obtain more accurate forecasting of business trends and um, looking at the future. In terms of looking at a little bit, bit more detail at some of our solutions, and four main ones in terms of information and security, there's Dark Trace, which is an autonomous threat detection and response um, solution. We were the first partner in the Caribbean um, starting in late 2016, and we are, we've had great success in providing this AI-based solution to help protect companies across the region. Searchlight Cyber is another partner providing um, intelligence into the deep and dark web. 
So there are two main products, Cerberus, Dark Web Intelligence, gives us a powerful investigation platform for uncovering criminal activity on the deep and dark web. And as one would expect, law enforcement is a, there's a strong use case for law enforcement and they're one of our main partners with Cerberus. There's Dark IQ for additional dark web monitoring. Our other partner, OneTrust, and they're the data privacy solution providers. OneTrust is actually leading global vendor of what is called trust intelligence solutions, which covers privacy, governance, risk and compliance, IT risk and security assurance, third party risk and environmental, social and governance, among other solutions. Fourthly, on the screen, you'll see data privacy and security advisors. And um, James represents that company as one of the founders of the organization. And they provide tremendous global expertise that we need at this time in Jamaica to ensure that we understand what needs to be done. We know how to execute so we can build lasting platforms and understand how to, how to implement and sustain our privacy initiatives. And James will be able to give some additional details about how this is done. Additional partners include our Click, our business analytics partner. And um, Click, Click is one of the leading vendors that provides um, a modern platform that helps you to leverage your data. Mimix, the financial application software provider, um, providing solutions for investment, trust, and banking. And Mimix, there are about 14 clients in Jamaica utilize Mimix software across the financial space. IT consulting and advisory services, these are services that we, Calibra, provide along with it our partners um, to assist our clients on their various initiatives. This next slide looks at Dark Trace, Cyber AI Loop. I mentioned earlier, this is where we leverage AI and machine learning, and we're able to have four main product families that constitute the solution. We're able to prevent cyber threats, detect, um, when they're in our environment and be able to respond and block them from a compromising the enterprise. And a new module that's be released next week called HEAL. What HEAL offers to do is, in the event that you're compromised as an organization, HEAL offers to restore you to normal operational state, leveraging AI. But of course, you need to have the other modules to be able to leverage HEAL um, in that sense. Our next slide looks at our trust intelligence platform that I spoke to earlier with our partner OneTrust. And OneTrust provides various modules as seen on this particular sl slide. In the interest of time, we're not gonna go through a lot of detail, but of course we can provide additional material, information, demos and so on, if required um, at a later date. Next two slides. Look at our business intelligence solution, Click, and this gives a this gives a graphic of an end-to-end -end data and analytics platform, which is Click. And again, we can provide more information given limitations of time in this particular forum. Um, similarly, this next slide looks at Click Cloud and its many benefits. Cloud platform meaning that you don't have to invest in your own servers and um, e equipment and hardware. You can leverage a cloud platform um, and simply subscribe using your own devices, your laptops and desktops and tablets and so on. And Click is based on modern technology, as I mentioned, using machine learning, um, AI, and various other technology components that allow you to do a lot more than you've been able to do in the past. 
moving along to our partners and um, our main partners at this time include Dark Trace, Searchlight Cyber, as I mentioned earlier, One Trust, Know Before for IT security awareness training, which is all important. And that companies tend to spend a lot on protecting their network with firewalls, all kinds of tools and technologies. But we need to train and equip and build awareness among our workforce so that the inbox doesn't, um, doesn't become a weak link in the chain. So security awareness training, as many of you know, is critical and very important. Click or BI partners I mentioned earlier, data privacy and security advisors, and, and um, James will give us a little more, bit more depth on, on DPSA, along with Hart Muren and Fata and Justine Collins will delve into the legal aspect of things and mimics, which I mentioned earlier. In terms of our customer base, um, Calibra, most of our clients are in Trinidad and Tobago, um, which is our, where our head office is based. But we do have a presence in most Caribbean countries. In Jamaica, we have maybe about five or six clients, including BOJ, um, Massey Gas Products, Jamaica Limited, um, Hardware and Lumber, um, BCMG Insurance Brokers as a new customer. And um, most of these clients are information security clients. We provide one or more information security related solutions for them. Now, moving forward, I'm talking a little bit about information security at a high level. Um, what we indicate is that information security has evolved from an earlier concept of computer security, but that has been replaced by a much broader concept of security being no longer the sole responsibility of IT or a small group of persons in the enterprise, but it's the responsible of everyone all across enterprise. We need to have the awareness, which is what I referred to earlier. This next slide looks a, a little bit at the information security model. Um, diagram that sort of outlines information security as a superset and various subsets that are involved with the different components. Going forward to our next slide, this gives an idea um, using a healthcare example of the different components of the information security stack. There's a hardware component, your network, your software, your data, which is very important, um, procedures, policies, and the various personnel that um, are part of your, your team and an important element in the ecosystem. Now, going forward with a couple of definitions, we're talking about personal data. And bear with me a little bit. Many of you are already very familiar with this. So, you know, we might be going in familiar territory. But just to reemphasize for those who may not be aware, we're talking about any information that is or reasonable could be attributable to a specific individual. And we have examples of different types of data. And why this is becoming increasingly important is that in the past, organizations didn't maintain some of these kinds of data. For example, biometric information, um, which is gonna be very important. Um, in Jamaica in particular, we're moving towards NIDS, uh, which means capturing a lot more individual data um, on the population. And much of this information is sensitive. And of course, there's a cause for concern about how the data is maintained. Um, we're talking about confidentiality. Um, we're talking about taking all kinds of steps to prevent, maintain confidentiality and not have data leaks and breaches, which um, we, we are very familiar with. Going to our next slide, defining data privacy. And um, in our scenario, we're looking at privacy 
as something that encompasses the rights and obligations of individuals and organizations with respect to the collection, the use, disclosure, and retention of personal information. Of course, this is not the complete picture or subject matter experts will delve into a lot more details pertaining to data privacy. Now, what is data protection about? And these are some of the, the bullet points indicate some of the, the, the key issues surrounding data protection. As individuals, organizations need to be open with people about how they use um, individual information. We do not need to keep their information longer than necessary. We need to make sure that it's accurate, it's up to date. We need to make sure that it's, it's, it's safe. And we need to know what information we keep and what we can do with it in terms of um, restricting the ability to share willy-nilly um, without considering uh, the various implications. Also, we have to prepare that while we'll do our best to protect this data, if there's a breach, we need to have a clear policy on what is to be done. And this relates to our incident response um, strategy about dealing with that eventuality if it happens. And in the few minutes that I have, we'll talk a little bit about information trends. Um, everyday companies collect, use, profile, etc., and analyze customer information. Unfortunately, some of this information is misused, stolen, abused, and various other things which um, we may not have time to get into right now. And this has led to a trust gap among customers and consumers. This next slide looks at privacy in the news. And of course, from time to time, we get various types of information about breaches that have occurred at different scales. And maybe one of the most dramatic, as shown in the slide, is the issue of Costa Rica, where the entire government was basically held to ransom for some time. Um, Costa Rica, incidentally, is a bit ahead of most other Central American and Caribbean countries in terms of their readiness and preparedness. They were able to withstand those threats. They end up not paying um, a ransom. Um, but it meant that for a significant time, their entire government in infrastructure was unavailable. And in a most recent event in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a situation where the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs was compromised. Most services were offline, and it meant that the population which needed various services that are provided by this ministry, they were no longer available. So the threats are real. It's a clear and present danger that we have to address. Moving forward, next slide looks at stakeholder concerns. Data protection is increasingly in the news, particularly for, for violations, as the previous slide reflected. And we're talking about customers and consumers being concerned about how and why their information is collected, used, disclosed, and retained. They want businesses to earn their trust and they want more control over how their data is utilized. Businesses similarly have a challenge to strike a balance between collection and use of information. And of course, government has a overarching responsibility and they have no option but to take increased action on the growing concerns of their population about privacy protect the rights of citizens, and to better manage their own vast repositories of data. So overall, why we're here today, data protection is about strengthening and unifying personal data protection for all individuals. And we come to the Jamaica Prote Data Protection Act 2020. Uh, the experts will go into a lot of the details, but the slight bullet points indicate some of the key elements. Um, it was passed by the government in June 2020. Office of Information Co Commissioner came into effect on December 1, 2021. And a two-year transition period was given 
for organizations to be ready. Uh, a monumental task, as we're all aware, and our mission is try to assist in that regard. Now, I know I probably utilize my time, so just to summarize, our suggestions is, despite the enormity of the task, we should not panic. Uh, we, you know, clear our thoughts, um, be aware of what needs to be done, and prepare ourselves to get it done. This is a legal requirement and we have to comply. And we, there are various considerations that have to be taken into account. And we leave that to our subject matter experts who will, will they'll take the floor shortly in their presentations. And the question is, given all the above, how do you achieve compliance and how can our team help? And in that scenario, my final slide is that our, our partners who are part of this presentation, we bring various skills, skill sets, competences, et cetera, to the table, and we're, we're able to assist you. And for the rest of the presentation, it's really about going into specific areas in which we can help and um, assisting um, in various ways that you may need. That's it from me today, folks. Thanks a lot for, for listening and participating. Thank you so much, George. Appreciate it. Now we will move to Ms. Justine Collins of Heart Muirhead Fata. Justine is a partner at Heart Muirhead Fata recently. Congratulations on that, Justine. With interests in financial technology, data protection, and electronic commerce law. She's also a member of the Jamaica Bar Association and is a lecturer in data protection at the Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus. So over to you, Justine, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, George, Calibra, DPSA, Stock Exchange, eCampus. Thanks for having us. Um, we are really happy to be here to highlight such a very important topic. Um, I know there are not a lot of attorneys on the call, so we just want to remind you as well that we will be applying for CLPD credits in terms of this presentation, so um, we will keep you informed regarding that. So I just want to turn our focus to the Data Protection Act. George gave a really good overview, um, but I will be looking at some of the legal aspects of the Data Protection Act. So just to give you a short overview of what we'll be looking at today, we'll be looking at some key definitions under the Data Protection Act, the Data Protection Standards, rights of the data subject, regulatory oversight, appointing a data protection officer, penalties, the GDPR, and of course, building a privacy program because we need to, to get into the how. So key definitions, what is this all about? What is data protection? Now, George would have spoken briefly about personal data. Well, personal data is really the whole point of data protection. We don't have data protection if we are not trying to protect personal data. And personal data really means information, however stored, relating to a living individual or an individual who's been deceased for less than 30 years. And that person can be identified from the information alone or from other information that the data controller has. So if you have, for example, my data, Justine Collins, she works at HMF, et cetera, all of that is my personal data. But if you look at just a generic set of numbers like a TRN, on itself, it's probably not personal data, but to tax administration or some other um, entity that has can link my TRN to me, then it becomes personal data. So that's what we mean by personal data. Well, sensitive personal data, and George spoke about biometric data and all the things that people are collecting nowadays. And sensitive personal data can be anything from biometric data, so your retina scan, your fingerprints. It can be things about your physical or mental health or condition, your beliefs, your political opinions, your membership in any trade union. 
all of that sensitive personal data. And there's certain higher standards in terms of processing sensitive personal data, which is why the distinction is important. Now, data subject, who is the data subject? What does that mean? That is the person that named or otherwise identifiable individual who's the subject of the personal data. So in the same example we talked about above, Justine Collins, I am the data subject. We are data subjects. All of us are data subjects and we have rights under the Data Protection Act. What does processing mean? Processing can be anything from obtaining, recording, storing, even consulting data can be deemed to be processing. So you might think, well, you know, we have a set of files and it's just sitting there. From time to time, we, we consult it, we look at it, we check it and we, we go back. So we're not really processing, but that may not necessarily be the case. Mere consultation of the data can be deemed to be processing under our act. And just to let you know, there is a QA. and a If you have any questions, you can let us know. You can ask questions in the chat. <clears throat> now the data controller. The data controller is that natural or legal person. It can be a public authority who either alone or jointly determines the purpose for which and the manner in which any personal data are processed. So it's a question of fact. Are you determining the purpose for the processing and the manner in which it's processed? Is that the is that your is that how you're processing data? Because that's distinct from a data processor, which we're going to look at in the next slide. So it's sort of a principal agent situation. Are you the one who's saying, this is what I want to do with the data. This is the reason I want to do it. You might be deemed to be a data controller. Now that data processor should is really a data, data processor is really that agent of the data controller. So that is the person who, or the entity that's taking instructions from the data controller. So if you have, for example, a call center or you have an IT, you outsource certain IT functions and they're doing it on behalf of the company, those could be data processors. Now let's take a brief look at the data protection standards with a focus on the first standard, but we're gonna look at all of them. Now there are eight data protection standards, the fair and lawful processing. We're gonna look at that in, in further detail in the next couple of slides. Fair and lawful processing really deals with, are you processing personal data fairly? Are you giving persons notice on why you're processing data? And our next presenter, DPSA, is going to go into privacy notices and privacy policies. You might have been on certain websites and seen where there's, you know, statements regarding how persons are processing your data. That's part of your fair processing requirements. So they are required to give, be very transparent in how they're processing data. And they're also supposed to have one or more lawful bases of processing data. Now, one of these can be consent, but there are many other bases you can rely on to lawfully process data. So that's the first basis. <clears throat> the second one is purpose limitation. You should be collecting data and processing data for one or more specified purposes. Data, data minimization. You should be collecting and processing data for if that is adequate, relevant to the purpose. So, for example, if you're going to buy a bottle of water, you're going to you're going to a corner store or a convenience store. Why would you need to provide your TRN number for that transaction? Is it relevant? Is it necessary for the purpose? Data accuracy. So, data should be kept accurate and up to date. So, if there are any changes. You should keep aware of it. The data subject can let you know. We're going to look at some of the rights. There's a right to rectify inaccuracies, but you should keep the data accurate to the extent that you are able to. Storage limitation. You should not keep the data for longer than you need to. So some of the times what happens when you have, it, and it also poses a security risk. We heard about information security. You have data from time immemorial 
from 30 years ago and, and you might have these employee dates or these records and, and the persons have probably moved on or died and then it becomes a sort of treasure trove of, of data that um, an illicit person or a, a criminal, a cyber criminal can then access. Compliance. So that one requires you to comply with all of the various obligations under the act. The seventh standard is information security, which of course is very, very important as George mentioned. Um, it's important to not only have technical controls in that George mentioned, but the staff is so important. When we hear about these incidents of information security, um, information security incidents, a lot of times it might be through the staff simply making a mistake or not knowing or not being aware of some of the protocols that the company has instituted for protection of personal data. And then data transfer. So data should not be transferred to a country that doesn't have adequate protections for personal data. So that talks about international data transfers that we'll get into in a moment. I'm gonna go into the first standard a little bit. So there are a number of bases, as I had said, for the processing of personal data. Now, we hear a lot about consent. We go on a lot of websites and we see consent. We see, please consent to this, please opt into this, please opt out of that. But consent is not the only basis. There are a number of bases upon which you can lawfully process data. So. Consent, of course, you need to get informed consent that is specifically given, unequivocal. And so this kind of, I, I, we've talked a lot about implied consent and whether or not we can imply consent from the circumstances and the use of a website or the use of the service. And that is not necessarily the case. Section nine of the Data Protection Act goes into very great detail about what consent is. And that standard is, similar to what we're seeing in the general data protection regulation. It is informed, it is specific, and it's an unambiguous um, de declaration of that choice. Now, you might not need consent, but perhaps you need it for a contract. So for example, you might have a contract, you might have an agreement to buy a house, for example, and in part of that is paying transfer tax and and all of the, the duties and fees that the government charges. And so you need the person's taxpayer registration number in order to um, have that contract concluded with the data subject. So that's another basis upon which you can rely. Um, if the processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation with which the data controller is subject. So right now we're having a lot of, we heard earlier today about anti-money laundering and AML. We have a lot of obligations, a lot of information to collect nowadays. And so we might be collecting as data controllers, KYC information to discharge our anti-money laundering obligations. If it's necessary for the administration of justice, if you have a court matter, and that information is important for that. Processing is necessary for the vital interests of the data subject. So if you're talking about a life and death emergency situation, you can't get the consent of the, the, the um, data subject. You can't get the consent of the data subject at that time. If it's necessary for the functions of government, you can also rely on that as a basis, or if the data subject has published the data. I'm going to reserve the answers to your questions in the question and answer because we're at least suppressed for time. So just going very, very quickly over the rights of the data subject, you have a general right of access to personal data. And this is important in terms of, from the data controller's point of view, if you know that data subjects have the ability to say, look, what is the information you're processing about me? you then need procedures to operationalize that right. How are you gonna get that data, personal data to actually comply with that request? Do you have a data inventory? Have you mapped the data across your organization and you're able to pull it together, collate it in an intelligible form for a data subject? So that's a compliance issue right there. 
consent is required for any direct marketing. So if you're going to send text, if you're going to send emails, that kind of push marketing directly to data subjects, you need to get their consent. They also have data subjects have a right to prevent processing of personal data that's likely to cause substantial damage or substantial distress. So if you feel as though that, per, that processing might cause substantial damage or substantial distress, that you have a right to prevent processing on that basis. You have certain rights in relation to automated decision-making. And this is, of course, is very topical now when we're talking about the world of artificial intelligence and AI and robotics, et cetera, automation, where it is that you are processing personal data and solely on the basis of automated decision-making, they have a right to be informed of the logic behind that decision-making. And you also have a right to request rectification of any inaccuracy. So if there's something that's wrong, you as the data controller need to now say to, to feed that request and say, OK, let's see how we can correct this inaccuracy. Okay. All right. In terms of regulatory oversight, I know there's a question in the chat about data protection officers. I think that's in the next couple slides and I hope that we'll respond to it. But the Office of the Information Commissioner has been established as of December 1, 2021. And Miss Celia Barclay has been doing quite a bit of work in the space, getting persons sensitized as well as hiring officers to assist her. Um, but the Information Commissioner's Office or the ICO as I call it, they monitor compliance under the Act. They're also going to be responsible for maintaining a register of data controllers. They will disseminate information about good practices. And if you've been on LinkedIn in the last couple of weeks, and I think they have a, a page on, on Instagram as well, they've been doing a lot of the frequently asked questions to answer some of the questions that companies are ha have about data protection compliance. Um, they, she also has the power to issue certain assessment notices, enforcement notices, those kinds of things to just monitor whether or not persons are complying and direct them to rectify um, issues. Hang on, sorry, there's a bit of questions in the chat. In terms of registration of data controllers, now you data controllers are required to register with the information commissioner's office. And there are certain registration particulars on the section 16 that are required to be provided, the name of the controller, the purpose of the processing, and whether or not there's any data transfers. Now, in terms of that registration form and the annual fee, we don't have that information as yet because that is to come out in the regulations which are forthcoming but it's very important to be aware of this requirement. We, as I'm not sure if it was stated before, but the deadline for compliance is November 30th, 2023. So time is running out, but as George says, don't panic because there is a way to get through all of this. In terms of appointment of data protection officers, which is a very big topic, now the act says that an appropriately qualified person should be appointed to monitor in an independent manner. So it's very important that that person, there's no conflict between their duties as a DPO and the duties of any other, any other duties that they may have. So it doesn't necessarily specify, okay, it needs to be a legal person or it needs to be an IT person or it needs to be a compliance person. There have also been instances where persons are engaging external DPOs, and there's nothing in the act that prevents that. You are required to appoint a DPO, not everybody is, but you are required if you are a public authority, if you process sensitive personal data, or if you process um, personal data on a large scale. A large scale processing is something that has not been defined under the act, but I'm seeing some guidance from the information commissioner's office in terms of what large scale processing means. That data protection officer is required to ensure that the controller processes personal data in compliance with the act. 
consult with the ICO as well as assist in the submission of a data protection impact assessment report, which James is going to get into. That's an annual requirement for uh, companies. Data breach management, when you have a security incident and everybody, you have a whole stakeholder team, the data protection officer plays such a pivotal role in terms of the, no the notifications to the ICO as well as notifications to the actual company. They encourage a, 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 an atmosphere or a culture of data protection awareness. Now, some of the, the recommendations that the Information Commissioner's Office have made in terms of what you need to consider in appointing your data protection office. And this is coming out of some guidance they published in June of this year. You want to think about the familiar, familiarity and access of this person. So is this person well acquainted with your organization? Are they able to then have a very a good overview of the sector in which you operate, where data is stored, um, how they can operationalize certain things. They may not necessarily be the person who would have built your privacy program, but they certainly have a good understanding of, of the business itself and the data that it, it um, processes. The person should also have some legal knowledge or specialized privacy training. So the Stock Exchange eCampus does offer a course amongst many other courses that offer specialized privacy training, but there are many others. There's the IAPP, there's um, various local organizations that offer this training. So you can look to see whether or not the persons that you're considering have specialized pr privacy training. They may need to have audits or compliance experience. When we talked about the data protection impact assessment report, that is something that has performed sort of an audit type of role. Technical skills and independence, independence being very, very important because the act does say that there shouldn't be a conflict of interest. And of course, excellent communication skills so that persons can approach them if they're not really sure about something related to data protection compliance. I want to go through very briefly some of the penalties that we see coming out of the act. Um, what's very, I guess, unsettling, but um, is, is alarming in a sense, is, is the, some of the penalties that you can face under the Data Protection Act. If it is that it's found that a company is not compliant and is in breach of the Data Protection Act, there is a discussion in terms of a fine not exceeding 4% of the annual gross worldwide turnover, right? So there are very steep fines, but as I said, this is nothing that is that we can't work through together. And I think that, you know, together we can try and formulate a, a path to, to compliance. Now, there's also the possibility if it is that an offense is committed with the connivance or neglect of a director, manager, or secretary of that company, that person may be liable as well. There, of course, is um, the possibility of civil liability where a person feels aggrieved by a breach, they may be entitled to compensation pursuant to certain, subject to certain parameters. So I'm gonna look very, very briefly at the GDPR because I think I'm running out of time. The GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation from Europe. It was entered into force in 2016 and um, required to be in member states' national laws by 2018. Now, what's very important for us in terms of the GDPR is that it has an extraterritorial effect. It is applicable to businesses established in the EU and outside of the EU if that business is offering goods or services to individuals located in the EU or is monitoring individuals located in the EU's behavior. So if you have a business where you do receive data subjects information from the EU, if you're offering goods or services to persons from the EU or you're monitoring their behavior, you may be subject to the GDPR. Importantly as well are international data transfers. 
international data transfers under the GDPR are not permissible unless they come within one of these categories. Now, if it is that the country is deemed to be an adequate, uh, a country that has adequate protections for the rule of law and freedoms, rights and freedoms of data subjects, the EU may determine that they are adequate and there's an adequacy decision that is made. Now, Jamaica is not one of those jurisdictions. It's a very short list. So because of that, we have to look at some of the other appropriate safeguards. So we can probably look at, um, we can look at appropriate safeguards that are put in place, standard contractual clauses um, or certification mechanisms, just to go through very, very briefly. So these are things that you can look at in terms of receiving data, data from persons within the EU. You have to be mindful of the fact that you can't just receive it without any type of protection. You might have to be looking at some standard contractual clauses or other kind of contractual mechanism or um, a certification mechanism if that is available to you. Finally, before I hand over to DPSA, because I think I have just two minutes left, I wanted to turn to some of the questions that you need to ask yourself in terms of building a privacy program and preparing yourself for the Data Protection Act. Now, I, we have formulated about nine questions for you to ask when you're thinking about data protection compliance. As George said, it is a big task, but it's not unachievable. Are your privacy risks properly defined and identified within your organization? Do you have an awareness of which privacy risks you face? Have you assigned responsibility and accountability for managing a privacy program? Do you or understand any gaps in privacy management? Do you know where there are? Are you already starting to think about, okay, well, these are things we need to have in place, and I'm not sure if we have enough protocols to manage data, personal data. Do you monitor privacy management? Are the employees properly trained? As we said, one of the biggest causes for data breaches and incidents is with employees either negligently or, or just inadvertently making, opening an email that they shouldn't open. Does the organization follow best practices for data inventories, your data inventories, your mapping, your understanding where everything lies is so important in terms of compliance. Do you have an incident response plan? If an incident happens, are you running around like chickens and being held hostage by somebody? Um, do, you, do, you, do you communicate privacy related matters and update the material as needed? And does the organization use a common language to address and manage information security risk on business and organizational needs? So I am out of time now, but the last thing I wanted to just look at was just some of the policies or, or procedures um, or um, notices to consider in terms of compliance. One of the biggest thing is your privacy notice, but it's one of many. So you might want to think about, do you have a procedure for managing third-party contracts, your data processors, your sharing of information? We talked a lot about the implications of sharing or transferring data. Um, data subject access requests, do you have a plan as to how you're going to deal with requests? Um, incident response plan, very important because when those things happen, they can dis disrupt your business and you need to have an idea of what you're going to do. I have run out of time, but I am very grateful to be here. And in the Q&A, I will answer all of your questions, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justine. And to reiterate, um, confirming to, all per to the persons who have submitted questions, we have received their questions and noted them, and we will come to them after the final presentation, but please keep the questions coming. So now, without further ado, I'll hand over to James Coons from Data Protect, Data Privacy, sorry, and Security Advisors. James is a founding partner at DPSA with over 30 plus years of experience in everything that we're talking about today, data protection, information security, IT systems management. Thank you so much, James. Over to you. Thank you. 
Um, just making sure I'm no longer on mute here. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting topic for me, and I'm sure um, not everybody would would share that sentiment. But um, a little bit about uh, our organization, the Data Privacy and Security Advisors. So, as indicated, um, I myself and and those uh, within my organization, we've been doing this a long time. Um, we're we're all very senior level folks, right? Um, I'll quickly touch on on our organization. We're more or less of a boutique uh, uh, advisory firm. Um, we're represented uh, throughout the U.S., but, but also in uh, the United Kingdom as well. Um, we've spoken about the GDPR. We were um, one of the first organizations to work with the Information Commissioner's Office um, uh, when, when, when the GDPR was first come about. We were called in to consult on, on various aspects, and we were also uh, called upon to assist with uh, producing guidance uh, that was then released by the Information Commissioner in the UK. So uh, again, doing this a long time, our organization's boutique, but but well, uh, you know, well represented. Um, we work with uh, various uh, things within within the privacy and compliance range. Anything from privacy technology to um, that what's in our name is just the advisory. Um, so we do assessments and audits, and that's not limited to. For example, we, we do uh, Jamaican data, uh, the JDPA as we call it, we, we'll, we'll do uh, Data Privacy Act assessments, readiness assessments there. Um, we do them for the GDPR. We've done literally thousands of them. Uh, we'll do that for US privacy legislation like the CCPA, the other various state laws. Um, outside of that, we do HIPAA, SOC 2, we do ISO readiness, and that's ISO 27701 uh, and 27001. Uh, so that's all pre-certification preparation. We'll take you all the way up to, to certification and then sit with you through that entire process. Um, we'll do HIPAA assessments, um, third-party vendor risk, uh, risk management as a whole. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that we do uh, within within our organization. We are privacy technology agnostic, although we are partners with, with OneTrust. Um, we are as well with TrustArc, Wirewheel. Um, I can't think of all of them that we partner with, but we, we use a number of different platforms. Uh, OneTrust is, is a go-to for us. Uh, we've been using that since it, uh, before it was released to the public. Uh, our organization sits on their board. Um, and, and product development board. So we're very close with that product. So we, uh, um, we, we work with that a lot, um, you know, especially now that we can do more with that. For example, we're doing ESG and sustainability uh, projects. We're doing ESG program management. Um, but all of that aside, um, George, both George and Justin brought up some great things. And, and maybe the question on everybody's mind is now, how do we operationalize this, right? Um, really quickly, compliance, we're all very familiar. Um, you know, it's, it's that proper handling of data, right? Um, because we know what happens if, if it's not properly handled or what can happen, right? Um, so people are always like, what does it mean to be compliant? We get calls all the time saying, hey, I need you to certify me for the GDPR. Um, I need you to. I need to be certified for uh, CCPA, and for a lot of these pieces of legislation, there's no such thing. Um, but what can be done is that you can demonstrate that you are compliance, and that's through various channels. And we're going to talk about some of those. Um, we all understand and know why it's important. Um, obviously, there are uh, the 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 administrative monetary penalties that, that could be assessed, the fines. Um, but there's also, um, you know, the, what we call the court of, of uh, public opinion, right? So uh, brand damage that can occur um, if, you know, uh, you experience a data breach. And then throughout that investigation, it's determined that there's negligence on the side of an organization. Um, that, that brand damage, we've seen it happen. 
um, it, it can be an extinction level event combined with, with the fine. So I always say there's the top five reasons that, that compliance is a necessity and that number one, and, and Justine will appreciate this, it's the law, right? So whether it's the GDPR or, or the JDPA or whatever it is, there's, you know, in California, the CCPA, CPRA, um, these, these laws, these acts compel you uh, to, to do certain things and, and be compliant. So it, it is the law. Number two, it maintains users' right to privacy, right? So this is, this is the spirit behind a lot of these pieces of legislation. Um, specifically, I'll talk about the GDPR. When that came about and, 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 and was, was going through its ascension process and when it was enacted, um, the, the main goal of this was to give people, uh, European residents, back control of their personal data. Right, we all know the saying: once something's on the internet, it's on there forever. Um, and these companies, these these larger than life companies, and and I don't think I need to name any names, but think about big search engines and social media platforms. Um, once they have your data, you have no idea how they're using it, where it's going. Um, these laws seek to to give control back. So that number two, maintaining a user's right to privacy. Um, that's something that Europeans have inherently. Here in the United States, we we don't really have that in our Bill of Rights. There's there's no mention of privacy there. Um, Louis Brandeis was the first mention of, of privacy, um, but but we don't have that inherent right. But these laws are seeking to give us those rights. And those that have been enacted are giving us those rights. Um, Number three, the, the third reason I like to give is that it prevents the PR disaster, right? So like I just said, the court of, 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 of public opinion will drag your brand down. Um, you know, I, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the 360 million MySpace accounts that were compromised and Equifax that exposed hundreds of millions of credit scores. Um, those were PR disasters. And, and MySpace is, is a dead platform today. Um, you know, uh, Equifax continues to struggle and find itself um, and has basically had to reinvent. Number four, the fourth of the five reasons is that uh, privacy compliant, uh, this goes hand in hand with what I just said about the PR disaster, but a privacy compliant organization is going to have a better brand image. George mentioned in one of his very first slides about being transparent, right? Talking about what you do <clears throat> and letting people know that we see that in these laws that it that's compelling you to do so. But that brand image, um, you know, uh, I'll pick on Apple right now. They're touting their commitment to privacy. Um, I was able to snap a picture of, of uh, Mr. Cook with the president of the IAPP in an event that we held. Um, they're, you know, they're, they are really trying to be privacy forward, um, and, and it is giving them a better brand image. And then the fifth reason quickly here is, is uh, it can lead or it can help prevent or, or lead to prevention of, of data breaches, right? In this day and age, it's unfortunate, but with, with data breaches, a lot of times you'll hear professionals say it's not a question of if it ever happens, it's a question of when it happens, right? But privacy compliance, um, you know, pr privacy compliance can help prevent, right? And and any ounce of of, of uh, prevention is worth that that pound of cure, right? So we want we want that we want to have solid programs to help prevent breaches. Um, so how do we get there, right? And, and uh, without going into the weeds on each of these points, um, you wanna have an overall strategy. Justine mentioned a lot of this, right? Um, you know, we get called into organizations, uh, our customer base, which I, I don't think I mentioned when I introduced our company, ranges from some of the largest airlines and manufacturers in the world to small businesses that have 20 and, and some fewer employees. Um, but you know, we, we've learned that no matter how big and complex organizations are, some of them don't have very comprehensive or measurable strategies for privacy compliance. Um, so, so that's one of the things that you definitely want to have. Um, you want to have uh, 
SMEs, right? You, uh, you know, beyond your your data protection officer, if you need to appoint one, but but you want to have folks that understand and are following whether it's HIPAA or the JDPA or the GDPR. Um, you want to have those folks on board, um, or at least you know have consultants that that possess that knowledge. Um, Again, inventory and assessment of your information. We call these data inventories. We've done tens of thousands of these. We do uh, we we uh, we do business process uh, mapping uh, and and data inventories based on business processes. Um, this is something that we excel at. As I said, we've done so many of them. But these these are what you need to have. True story. I was in in New York City with a client a very large uh, and, and famous client. And I was in their office um, because I had just completed a comprehensive data mapping of hundreds of business processes for them. And, and as I was sitting in this boardroom, pagers and phones went off and suddenly I was alone. Everybody got up and left. And 15 minutes later, I peered my head out the door and the FBI was there um, because the organization had just been breached. Um, all of a sudden I had a spotlight on me because, hey, this guy over there was just in our data looking at things. So initially an awkward situation turned into something very interesting where they had asked me about what I, I had done. And they took those data maps and those data inventories and they were quickly able to isolate and contain the breach because we knew where things were and where it was being shared. Um, so, so data maps, super important for a number of reasons. Um, policies and procedures, Justine mentioned a lot. I'm going to mention a few here. Um, we're going to talk about those, but you, you should have solid policies and the procedures that go along with them. Um, incident response, um, just like when the FBI showed up, um, you, you want to be able to react. Uh, I'm a former military guy, so, so I know the importance of being able to, to respond um, when an incident occurs. A lot of times we get the phone call after an incident's occurred and that's that's okay and we can assist organizations, but those that have prepared beforehand and have things in place, things do go definitely a lot easier. So having that response plan in place is super important. Um, along with that, keeping proper compliance documentation, whether that's your, your data maps and inventory, um, all of your policies, you want to keep all of this document, PIAs, DPIAs, and we're going to talk about those. Um, and then, you know, finally being able to demonstrate proof of, of compliance or guaranteeing that, that you're, you're compliant, right? Ready to present to, to, to any, whether it's a regulator or, or uh, you know, e even, even uh, data subjects, right? You, you, you need to be able to, to, to prove that, that you're compliant. Um, beyond then your monitoring and that you have controls in place. Um, so one big thing that we do are what we call assessments or, you know, commonly folks will say gap analysis. And this is all part of something that, that would be part of your, um, you know, compliance documentation. Um, it really, you know, we, we do these, we'll do these when we come on board with, a, with an organization initially to kind of set the baseline and see where we're at. Um, you know, we're doing one now uh, with, with Calibra together um, for, for, for an organization in, in, uh, in the area and we're, we're, um, we're doing, it, it's in Jamaica and we're doing a JDPA assessment. So we're going to see where they're at. Um, these assessments are bespoke. They're not from templates that are, you know, found in one trust. We create the templates. Um, they're based on the regula regulation. And how we do that, obviously, we identify the legal requirement. Um, you know, we're going to look at what existing policies are and, and or procedures are in, in place for collecting, managing, securing data, um, employee access, employee training, things of that nature. We'll look at overlaps, right? Um, George talked about security, Justine talked about privacy, and those are two very different things, but they go hand in hand and there's a lot of overlap. So we're going to look for overlaps there. Something might be in a, in a security policy um, and not in a privacy policy. So we look at all of those things during these assessments. Um, and then we're going to identify those gaps, right? Um, we're we're going to look at sections of the law that your organization 
has to consider and those that, that maybe you don't. Um, we're gonna look at policies, procedures, um, maybe those can address, maybe it's controls. Um, and then very important with an assessment, you, you need to sit down and then chart your next steps, whether that's implementing controls, um, updating policies, and then you know reassessing over a certain amount of time. So depending on, on what your gaps look like, um, you know, you might want to do some, some remediation work and then reassess. Or, you know, if, if your risk appetite for the organization is okay with where you're at, you might say six months or a year down the road, we're going to reassess and, and see where we're at because there might have been changes to the law. And then by then, we, we might see some precedent sent through enforcement action um, that'll give us a better idea of what the regulator specifically is looking at and how they react to those things. Um, so, you know, we always say to, to get the most out of a gap analysis, um, it's always having that external third party um, that has a, a, a deep understanding of the legal requirements or, or, uh, or the privacy legislation that's impacting your business. That way things can stay, uh, you know, there, there's really no conflict of interest and, and things can kind of stay on the up and up there. Um, if you look at a company like mine, all we do is privacy. Um, we don't we don't do anything else. We live this day in and day out. So having an organization that does that assess your gaps versus someone that you know that's just part of their job, um, it does definitely make a difference. So uh, as Justine mentioned, a bunch of policies, um, and one of them was the privacy policy. So re really quickly, a lot of so in my world, in, in, in the privacy and data protection world, you know, privacy policy, we say privacy statement, because normally when we talk about privacy policies, this is an internal document, whereas a privacy statement or a privacy notice is what's found publicly on your website, because you're giving notice or you're, you're making a statement. Um, so, so this is what you're saying to the world. This is what you're saying to the data subjects, to the people that are looking at your company through your website, on your privacy notice. Um, you have to have, nowadays you have to have a good one. Um, in the past, privacy policies or privacy notices were, were, were written by lawyers to appease other lawyers. Um, and now there, there's rules because of legislation. Um, now, you know, they have to be uh, understandable. Um, they have to be clear. They have to be, you know, uh, they have to con contain certain pieces of information, right? Um, they, they can't just be a bunch of, of what we say legal ease um, that, that would confuse, right? So the best way or, or, or best practices uh, for a good notice would be to align your practices um, and promises that, that you're making um, you, you do the legal due diligence, but most importantly, you, 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 you're doing what you say in that, in that privacy statement, right? So everything that you have in there, you need to ensure that you're, you're doing those as well, right? Um, multiple layers, right? So, you know, a, a layered, uh, a layered privacy statement is, is huge, right? Um, you know, um, you know, your first layer should be the short and simple layer, right? Um, and can be sometimes more like a, a mission statement. And then from there, um, you know, that would be your highlights. Um, and there's some really good layered policies out there. If you look at IBM, Microsoft, National Geographic, Procter & Gamble, they all have great layered policies where they have that initial section that is just um, kind of an intro um, and highlight uh, of things in their notice. And then uh, in, in, in a second layer, it, it gets a little bit deeper where they, they take each of the, those highlights and break it down. And then some go for like a third layer where that third layer is usually like an FAQ and those are really great as well. Um, choose your words carefully. Um, this, this is also very important, right? Um, make sure that if you're using terms that that might be considered, like I said, legal ease, make sure you're defining them. Um, you know, you know. Again, 
you, you want this to be understood by everyone who, who would be potentially reading it, right? Um, you, you don't want to use um, excessive wording or, or, or things like that. You want it to be clear, concise. Um, you know, you, you, you want to say things, you, you want to let the consumer know how much you do care, how much the organization cares about their privacy. Um, and you want them to definitely understand that. With that, use short sentences, um, bullet points, active voice, right? Um, those things are important as well. Um, review it and publish it accordingly, right? So you want to you want to review this. Make sure it's reviewed by multiple stakeholders. If you've appointed a DPO, make sure they're reviewing it. If you have legal counsel, um, you want them reviewing this and then keep it updated, right? Um, th that's the one thing that should always be at the top and prominent on your privacy statement or notice is the date that it was published. And you wanna make sure that you're keeping that as up to date as possible. Um, our general rule of thumb is to keep it, you know, within 12 months. So, so you're updating it annually. I won't talk too much here as, as uh, you know, Justine brought up a lot of these, but, you know, the, the list could go on. And if you're ever looking at doing ISO certification, you have your ISMS policy pack, which is way more policies than this upwards of 40, um, but super important ones, you know, cookie policy and cookie notice along with your privacy notice. A lot of legislation, uh, GDPR, and in the U.S., uh, the, the CCPA, require choice on cookies. Uh, they define uh, cookies as, as software being installed on a machine. So there's a lot of, of rights extended to, to consumers there. Um, it's essential in the landscape today to have something like that. Other good ones to have an employee privacy notice, right? We've heard that from 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 uh, Justine and we've heard that from George um, you know if a employees aren't aware or don't know um, you know they 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 can you know cause a, an incident um, so having an, an employee notice is, is super important an internal privacy policy again along those same line it goes hand in hand with your training and awareness um, they should have a, a, a solid policy internally, not your website privacy policy. The, this talks, of, talks about your internal um, privacy and, and the standards that you have. Vendor management, huge these days. We, we do a lot of vendor management programs, so um, that, that's also near and dear to our heart. Breach and incident response, as I mentioned before, having that um, in hand, your, your InfoSec policy and data subject access requests, they're the DSAR or, or privacy rights, um, as some call it. Um, we feel that one of the best practices there is to automate that and, and use technology. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of, of uh, frivolous requests these days, but, um, and I'll talk about these here in a minute, but um, you know, something important to have would be a policy around that, because if you start getting them, you need to know how to carry them out. So as indicated, a requirement under the JDPA or, um, would be the DPIA or the Data Protection Impact Assessment. Um, so unless you, you've been indicated that, that you don't need to, data controller has to submit annually uh, a DPIA. Um, and that's got to contain a detailed description of the envisaged, envisaged processing um, and the purpose of that processing, um, an assessment of the necessity, right? So, so, so why uh, you're doing this and the proportionality uh, of the operation, right? So, so the, so kind of the why and, and moreover, you know, does that make sense for your business to be doing that? Um, uh, and then the risk, looking at the risk and the risk particular to the data subject themselves, right? Would this infringe on their rights and freedoms? Um, uh, the, you know, and, and then any measures you have in place, any safeguards, right? So not only have you uh, done a, a risk assessment of that, but what safeguards do you have in place? What security me measures, right? Do you have you know, IDS, um, do you have, you know, encryption, any of those things? What's, what's, uh, 
you know, what's in there? What, what, what have you done to demonstrate that, that you're protecting this particular data flow? Um, so the DPIA, um, we do a myriad of these, um, again, mostly through uh, privacy technology. So for example, in OneTrust, we create bespoke DPIAs based on the organization and the uh, particular legislation at hand. Um, and then that's a kind of an assessment driven facility where subject, ma subject matter experts within the company answer questions. Once they complete and submit that, there's a small interview process with one of our privacy experts um, where we'll, we'll go through the, uh, the impact assessment. Um, we'll ensure that it's captured uh, risk if there is any, and then that's cataloged and then presented back to the organization for review. Um, and then it can be furnished to, to whoever needs that um, up, up to, the, uh, to the information commissioner. Now, data subject access requests. Um, uh, quickly touch, touch on these. Um, they, they are uh, increasingly important, right? As, as more and more privacy legislation uh, comes out and the spirit of that legislation is, is, is giving rights to data subjects or, or to the consumer, these are important. This is how they exercise their rights, right? This is how they get their control back. Um, they're able to submit a request to an organization for a number of different things, depending on, on, on what that legislation could be. And that could be, hey, I just want to know what you have on me, all the way up to, hey, I want you to forget about me and erase all my data. Um, so, so really, these, these data subject requests or, or, or privacy rights are the foundation of a lot of, of uh, privacy laws. Um, they they help with other aspects of the privacy laws, for example, the data minimization, right? So if, if a consumer requests their data and you signed up for their email newsletter and they, you send them the data you have and you have their hair color, their eye color, their data, date of birth and, and weight and all of this crazy stuff, um, that might come into question, right? Why do you need that to email me a newsletter? Um, so, it, so it kind of helps with, with lowering risks, you know, when, when there's a data minimiza minimization principle. Um, they can help with, with identifying your legal basis, as, as Justine discussed, that's super important. Um, purpose limitation, which is saying, hey, I collected that email and that name just to send you a newsletter. It is limited to that purpose. I am not using it for anything else. Um, you know, th these, you know, processing activities, and I talked about the data maps early, earlier in the privacy impact assessments, right? You need to have those, right? If somebody makes a request and says, what data do you have on me? I need to know where to look. I need to know what data I'm collecting and where it's where it sits and who who might have that in an onward transfer, um, and then they they kind of help you keep your notices and your vendor management up to date, um, and then if you have any internal privacy policy security retention, um, they assist with that as well. Um, so, I uh, again this was already spoken about and and. Uh, I, I'm, I'm between uh, you and, and the Q&A, which I'm, I'm super excited for. I hope we have a lot of questions. So I'll end with this. Um, this was already spoken about, but you know, under the, the JDPA, um, Jamaican citizens have rights as well, um, the, the right to be informed. So, so they, they, they have the right to know what forms of personal data are being collected uh, about them, as well as what that that is going to be used for um, the right to correction, uh, ratification. Uh, you know what what uh, what happens if there's an error or an inaccuracy? They have the right that that is corrected by the organization that has that uh, errant data. Um, the right to erasure. This was big with the GDPR, right? The right to be forgotten. Um, so so the data subject can request that any personal data that the business has. Um, that, that, that was collected or being processed can be deleted, right? There's, you know, restrictions around that and, and certain things, but for the most part, they have that right. Um, 
and then the right to uh to object or or opt out of of processing right so um you know targeted advertising the sale of personal data profiling activities that's a big 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 thing right um anything that 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 may affect the consumer they can opt out of that um and then the automated decision making again we've seen this before with the gdpr we've seen all of these with the gdpr um but data subjects can can say um, I don't want my personal data used to, to make an automated decision on me, right? So if I put in a bunch of information um, uh, uh, to maybe apply for a credit card um, and it just uses, you know, collected data to make that decision, I can say, no, I don't want that. I want, I want a human being to look at my information and consider that. Um, so with that, um, you know, I always ask the question when you think about these rights, think about, you know, do, do you have an easy way to fulfill these requests? Um, you know, obviously we recommend uh, uh, privacy technology. They automate these. Um, they have bot protection that can be implemented, right? Um, it's done cleanly through a web form. If you're using something like TrustArc or OneTrust, and there's, there's more Truyo, there's a lot of them that we use. Um, they all have a very similar facility where they'll have a portal, right? Because to fulfill these requests, you're going to have to collect data from whoever's making the request. So that's all you really need is to be collecting more data. So um, they provide secure platforms for that, and then you can, uh, you know, you can de-identify that um, or even eradicate that data once it's fulfilled. So with that, I'll hand things back over. Uh, appreciate everyone's time, and uh, really looking forward. Hopefully, we get some uh, we get some good questions. Thank you, James. Yes, we have a few questions. So I'll, I'll actually ask Justine to start. Um, I'll moderate the questions, Justine. So first question we have, when you mentioned data processor, you said other than the employee, is it that employees are not data processors? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So data processors are not employees. Data processors would be separate from the data controller. Employees would, any kind of employee action that's done within the course of their employment would be attributable to the data controller. Thanks, Justine. I believe you covered this during your specific section about the data protection officer, but I will I will read Christopher's question. I believe you mentioned that a data protection officer can be a legal person. What constitutes a company that can operate as an officer? Okay, thanks for that, Chris. Um, I believe that so so there's no specific requirement in terms of the data protection officer um, and that external company or a company itself. What's very important is the two things that they're appropriately qualified and that there's no conflicts of interest. So in terms of how you're going to structure it, it really is a question of fact. Does if you're going to use an external DPO or a company or a subsidiary or whatever, just make sure that that person or that legal entity's um, duties do not conflict um, with the duties as a their regular duties. So whatever it is they're doing or servicing or the services that they're providing to the data controller, it can't be in conflict. There also is some guidance from, I think there's an article 29 working party opinion that goes into the data protection officer and further clarification regarding that engagement. So you can have a look. Justine, uh, two questions from Wayne McClockin. The TRN, or at least the Jamaica TRN, is at the front of our driver's license. As this is technically sensitive data, as it you know relates to financial information, tax information, should this not be changed just from a data protection aspect? Uh, well, I don't think it's necessary. Um, but certainly we'll see what the government proposes when our national identification system comes out. 
I don't see there being a change, but I, I really would leave it up to them. Um, it really depends because at some point you will need to provide, if you're giving your driver's license, it is a form of identification as it stands right now. It's usually your driver's license, your voter's ID or your passport, mm -hmm. all of which will contain sensitive information by its very nature. So I don't see there being a change, but I really would leave it to the authorities to determine whether or not they're going to make any changes when they do the national ID system. Okay, related related to that, I, I saw mention of, of just persons having an issue with acceptance of the driver's license to confirm their TRN. I know in some instances, some government entities don't allow you to use the driver's license as proof of TRN. I mean, if once we have the new NIDS document, I think that would be great in terms of merging a lot of data. Additional question from Wayne, which is related to what you mentioned about attorneys and, and credit. Uh, will non-attorneys get CE credit? Well, we, we would need to know what organization, what professional organization you are referring to what it might it might be easier for you to to submit it yourself i'm not familiar with the processes for any other particular organization but if you you can you can reach out to us and we can provide you with any information that you require in order to um, get your professional credits great thank you okay two more questions which could be thrown out to the general team so with respect to sharing data across borders, if there's a scenario where a data controller is part of a group and the practice is to share data within that group, however, there are no jurisdictions um, with similar legislation in place or the legislation is not in effect or enforced, are there any implications for the data controller? James, you want to take this first before I respond? Sure. So that that's a, a, a great question. Um, in, in a previous life, I was uh, a chief privacy officer in a group company, um, very similar situation. So um, what we had done, and, and this was a, a, a company with uh, headquartered in the United Kingdom. Um, so what we had done is, is uh, model contracts or standard contract contractual clauses um, be, between the entities. Um, and, and so, you know, wh where there is no legislation, um, you kind of as an organization need to make uh, a determination um, and, and consider uh, a global privacy, you know, uh, how to say it, but like a, a global privacy program and demonstration of compliance, right? So in the United States, we're dealing a lot with you know, we, we don't have federal legislation, but now we have, you know, a, I think there's four states where there's legislation that's now being enforced and, and a plethora of others where it's in some sort of, you know, whether it's pending going into to enforcement or it's being considered. Um, so so what, what you do in a particular situation like that, um, if, if your organization is so inclined is you looked at the strictest subset um, and and then use that as your baseline. So here in the U.S., typically that's the California uh, Consumer Protection Act, the CCPA slash CPRA, and you take those guidelines um, and and you carry that out even into areas where um, th there is no is no coverage, right? And this might go back to things I said about you know uh, this looks good for your brand, for example, right? Um, and this is being globally transparent. But, you know, in a situation like that, you know, you can have contract internal contracts with your business entities, right? So you could have model contracts where, you know, maybe one entity is a controller or processor and vice versa, or joint controller and processor. You can have those, those instruments in place. Um, at the very minimum, that shows a good due diligence defense if something ever does happen. You can say, look, you know, we have a privacy standard internally. We have all the policies that Justine and I have spoken about, and you have, you know, model contracts in place. So 
if Justine, you want to add. Yeah, certainly. Um, so this is something that I think will be a, a live issue for a number of companies within the Caribbean because a lot of regional conglomerates are going to have this challenge where we do have these international data transfer rules in most of the, the jurisdictions that have passed data protection laws, but we don't have that adequacy um, you know, protocol that, that we're seeing coming out of the EU. And, I think that James's suggestion is the best one, and, and certainly what you're seeing in, in larger companies across the world, where they sort of choose one or two jurisdictions, and, and those are sort of the strictest, as, as James says, or best practices, the gold standard, and you comply, and by virtue of you complying, you sort of filter down through the group, and certainly by actually having those contracts that gives a level of assurance regarding any data that you're transferring within the group, even if it's Jamaica to Trinidad. I mean, this, this, very, this very webinar is a cross-jurisdictional cross webinar. Um, so if you're doing Jamaica to Trinidad or any other country in the Caribbean or, or otherwise, of course, different jurisdictions have different rules. Um, you'd want to, to comply in that manner. Of course, if we're looking at the EU, there are some things known as, as binding corporate rules, which then have to go to the relevant officers, authorities too actually approve them, which is a separate type of discussion, but it really depends on which jurisdictions you're looking at. Um, I think James's advice is the most practical in terms of us in the Caribbean. Thanks, Justine. Uh, two, two more quick questions for you, uh, specific to the Office of the Information Commissioner. There, there is no particular type of registration form um, that is in place and that won't be ready until regulations have been finalized. Is there a form that you recommend persons complete in the interim, um, specifically persons or organizations who have begun the compliance process? Okay, that's a good question. I think James as well can answer it, but we do have some checklists to start compliance. And of course, the best way to start is doing a gap analysis to just understand where you stand. Um, so we do have a sort of checklist as to the steps that you need to take in terms of compliance, which is separate from, I think, the registration form that the ICO is going to require. The ICO has a set number of, of information that she's going to ask for, the registration particulars, that is very similar to the record of processing activities you see in the GDPR. It's on the section 16, and that is what's going to be submitted the information commissioner's office so it's it's slightly separate from your steps to compliance um but it certainly gives you it, it, it when you comply and you follow the checklist and the steps you can then have the information to submit that form to the ico yeah i'll i'll piggyback there exactly that's what we're doing for for clients in jamaica um, we call them article 30 reports so that's basically the ropa record of processing activity so as defined uh, under Article 30 of the GDPR and in guidance that was put together by the Article, well, Article 29 working parties now defunct, it's the EDPB now, but guidance that was, was put together um, prior to them becoming the EDPB with the enactment of, of the GDPR, that's what we do, right? So, so it's, it's, you know, as I said before, being able to demonstrate compliance and part of that is having the documentation. Well, our goal with with our our partners and and uh, uh, clients in in Jamaica right now is that they have enough documentation that no matter what's asked for by the ICO that they would be able to furnish that. Generally, if you have a gap assessment that shows that you've done you know an overall assessment against the the act as well as records of your processing activity and the impact assessments um, associated with the business processes. Um, I can't imagine that there would be much more asked for um, that, that wouldn't be on any of, of, of that collection of, of documentation. Thank you both Justine and James. How do you register with the information, sorry, with the Office of the Information Commissioner? So the regulations are forthcoming, and so we should get the forms for registration in those reg regulations. And once we 
have those, we would be in a better position to um, speak to the process. Okay, I will also um, generally answer two additional questions. So presentations will be circulated. We will share this webinar's recording with everyone and you will have access to see the registrations again. There is also a question with reference to how attorneys can obtain proof of participation. Um, Justine, I know you mentioned that a list of attorneys will be sent to the GLC. However, if anyone wants to just ensure that they are specifically on the list, please reach out to me by email or you can um, email info at calibrasolutions.com and I'll make sure that the information gets sent across to Justine. Also, just to add as well, if you could include your attorney number, um, that would be very helpful. Thanks, Justine. And one final question, which is, is actually from me. So in light of everything that has been shared by yourself, Justine, James, and George, if I am an organization, small, medium, large, and you know, in light of the pending compliance deadline, if, if I need urgent help, like I'm, I'm at ground zero, what are the recommended key steps that I need to take? Obviously, there are a lot of things I need to do, but if you were to, to just give me three immediate key steps, what would they be? Go ahead. You want to start, start, James? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, so, so having lived through this with the GDPR, um, one one thing I will say is is start now. And this is not none of what I'm saying is a sales thing. Look, I'm fine. We're fine. Um, you know, um, if, if you do need help, obviously call us. Right. Any of us that pre presenting today can can help you with various aspects. But um, not meaning this is sales, but start now. What happened with the GDPR? We, you know, it, it was kind of a, a, a slow wave and there were, you know, lulls. Um, and then within months of, of the enforcement deadline, we were hammered, um, which was great because we could pick and choose work and there, you know, there was really no shortage. Um, but what that meant was a lot of companies had to wait. Um, and, and uh, you know, so, so there was a lot going on. Um, top three things, right? Assess your program, uh, do that gap analysis, get a picture of where you're at, um, create a, a, a remediation roadmap. These are all things that we do. Um, and then start whittling away at it, right? Um, so those three things I think are key, right? And that's gonna cover you pretty much from A to Z, right? You wanna get ahead of the game, um, you know, I, I would like to say that I don't think that the information commissioner or any of the regulators have their eyes on anyone. It was a little bit different with the GDPR. Yeah, I think everyone kind of knows that that the ICO when she was uh, when she was the ICO, she had her eye on certain organizations, right? Um, that that were to 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 kind of be looked at initially. Um, and then now, as obviously as time goes on, that's you know matured and enforcement is at a much broader base now, and and that's most likely going to happen with the JDPA. But uh, assess your program, get you know determine your gaps, and 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 get remediation going now, um, so that you're ahead of the game. Thanks for that, James. I I would just like to add to that. I think that what you really, a lot of persons are starting from zero and, and that's that's a challenge that we have. But then when you actually look at it, you may have some IS procedures because IS has been a very live issue for a long time. And IS is not the same as data protection, but they certainly do go hand in hand. So I think that once you have that understanding and, and, and critically understand the concepts because sometimes you look at organizations and you look at the amounts of data or the type of data that they're collecting. And it's not a lot of personal data. It might be a lot of employee data, but they're in manufacturing or they're doing things that are really vendor related, not necessarily dealing with personal data. And so that's why we really try to start with the foundations and the concepts. Um, 
as a beginning, and then we work it from there. So the gap analysis, understanding the data that you have is part of that gap analysis, remediation plan, as James said, and of course, actually implementing it and, and operationalizing it. It's one thing to have these policies and then another thing for nobody to know how to use it. So. If I may add, Grace here, of course, what comes first is what James and Justine have outlined, but then to automate the process, to have it operating on an ongoing basis, that's where the technology comes in. Um, so they're, they're, they've outlined the steps that are initially required, but of course, um, having an automation approach will um, help tremendously, depending on volume considerations, of course. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much, George. And well, guys, all good things have to come to an end, as they say. <laughs> I want to express my sincere appreciation to our presenters, George, James, and Justine, for offering your time and expertise. It was honestly well received, as well as the team from the Jamaica Stock Exchange. So Alafia, Shanique, and Shireen, thank you so much. Thank you as well to Principal Powell for allowing us to have this partnership. So please, Alafia, please extend our thanks to him. I, I would like to also thank my colleagues at Calibra Solutions Limited who provided tremendous support to get the attendance here. We're so grateful to all of you for, for coming out and for staying with us for two hours. Also to the team at TCJ Events, thank you guys. Wouldn't have even had the webinar without you. And to, of course, everyone who's attended, we appreciate your time. As mentioned, we will provide you with a recording of the event as well as contact information. And of course, if you have any questions at all, please email us at info at calibrasolutions.com. We look forward to having you for future webinars and please have an excellent rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.